Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to your first formal lecture of computer networks CS307. We will be following uh, the slides from uh, your main textbook computer networks uh, top down approach by Q Ross and Ross. I believe most of you would have uh, downloaded this uh, book by now. If not, uh, please Google it. Uh, PDF copies of this particular book are available online. And uh, just in case if you guys uh, find any difficulty in uh, searching for this book, then let me know and I will provide it to you. Thanks. So lecture number one is going to be about uh, introduction to networks. Okay. We'll briefly discuss a few basic terminologies that we come across in computer networking and we are going to define the architecture of the internet and the everyday applications that we use that are connected to the internet. So this is the formal outline for this particular chapter. The goal or the learning objective is to get a feel or uh, uh, let's say try to understand the basic terminology of computer networks and as we move along we'll cover more in depth and uh, detailed literature related to networks in the course. Uh, like I explained to you in the previous lecture as well in the very first lecture where we discussed the course outline, we are going to use the global internet as a use case, an example or as a case study during, the, uh, during this particular course and refer to it uh, back and forth whenever we are discussing different types of network related frameworks, network technologies and network protocols. So the basic overview of uh, chapter number one is first of all define what is the internet. Okay. What is a protocol? What is the difference between a human protocol and a machine protocol? What are the different types of network edges or edge systems? What are hosts, access networks and what do we mean by the physical media that is connecting the end systems or these network edges? Okay. The second part is network code okay that is the heart of the network what type of technologies do we use at the network code whether it is packet switching or whether it is circuit switching okay and what is the structure or the format of the global internet then we we'll look at a few parameters that are related to the network which we use to measure the performance of the network okay so we will come across terms like packet loss packet delay what is the difference between throughput and bandwidth? And in addition to that, I will give you some brief overview or a brief idea related to network security. The protocol layers, service models like OSI reference model, etc. Okay. And the history of the internet. So in the chapter one roadmap, let's uh, discuss section number 1.1 so, uh, first of all. And in this section, we are going to define what is the internet. Okay, so let's take a look at what is the internet. What is the nuts and bolts or what are the primary devices that comprise the internet? Okay, so we have millions of connected computing devices around the world. Okay, these computing devices um, can be referred to as hosts okay they can also be referred to or called as end systems end systems because they are at the very end of the network okay these end systems or these hosts run a variety of applications which we call network applications so if you look at the left side of the figure you will see plenty of uh, end systems you have a personal computer a server a wireless laptop a smartphone all of these devices are connected to the internet or to the network and all of these devices run network related applications. Okay. The type of the network that they connect to can be different. Okay. So they can connect via Wi-Fi to your local Wi-Fi hotspot. They can also connect via 3G, 4G, even 5G to your mobile network. Okay. Or they can be connected via an Ethernet cable to your next door or your corridor router or switch. Okay. As is the case with the, the computers in your lab. In the university most of those end systems those computers are connected via a cable which we call an ethernet cable ethernet being a networking technology so we use this ethernet cable to connect the end system 
to a switch. You would have seen these switches in the cabinets uh, somewhere in the corridor or maybe even in the lab. So there are a variety of ways in which you can connect your end system to basically an end user device. Okay. So these communication links could be of fiber that is optic fiber. These could be copper based. These could be radio signals, which is wireless. These could even be satellite signals. Okay. The transmission rate, the speed at which you can transfer data between the end system and the switch or between the end system and your global internet or any other network is referred to as the bandwidth of that network. Okay. So the transmission rate, the rate at which you can transfer the bits or the information or the message, let's say, from the end system to the network and vice versa. Okay. That defines the transmission rate, which in everyday life we refer to as the bandwidth of the network. Okay. Then in addition to the communication links and these end systems, there are certain other devices which are classified as packet switches. These are the devices that take the information or the bits coming from the end systems and forward it within the network to other networks and those networks in turn deliver it to the end systems on the other side. Okay. These packet switches are responsible for forwarding of packets or let's say chunks of data. There are two different types of packet switches which are available in the network. The first device is called a router and the second device is called a switch. Now there is a subtle difference between a router and a switch. Okay. Once we cover OSI referencing model and protocol layering, I will describe to you or uh, we will discuss the main difference between a, ro a router, a switch, a hub, a bridge, etc. Okay. But for now, try to understand that the global internet or any network is comprised of three different types of devices. First one being your hosts or end systems, which are running network related applications like email related software, web browsing software, etc. The communication links which join these end systems to the network, these communication links could be either wired or they could be wireless or they could be fiber based or satellite comms based. Okay. And thirdly, packet switches, which are in the core or the heart of the network and which take the inf information coming over these communication links and forward it to other communication links. So transfer the data between two different end systems which are connected to the network. On the right side, you have plenty of different types of networks. Again, a mobile network, a global ISP. ISP stands for Internet Service Provider. A regional Internet Service Provider or ISP, which is a bigger company. Okay as compared to your local ISPs. You have a home network, which is showing you two computers connected to a wireless router, which is connected to your internet service provider. And at the bottom, you have a campus network or an institutional network, which comprises of plenty of computers, which can be connected either via wired or via Wi-Fi to the heart of the network, that is the routers, the packet switches. Along with the laptops and with the computers, you also have server devices okay which are connected to this particular uh, network via these packet switches or these routers okay now these days you would have come across plenty of uh, again devices okay a number of different types of devices are these days connected to the internet okay you may have come across the term Internet of Things or IoT. IoT basically means that most of your everyday appliances, whether that is a smart fridge or a smart toaster, or whether it is a handset, they are connected via your communication links, which are either wired or Wi-Fi to the global internet. What is the benefit of this? The benefit is that the user yourselves, they can connect to these devices remotely by using network related applications. Okay. So applications on your mobile phones, which can enable you to manage the parameters or the settings or the monitoring 
of these individual devices okay so you have an ip picture frame which is connected to the network which in turn is connected to the internet so you can be anywhere in the world and you can upload different types of images on this ip picture frame and you can change the configuration you are web enabled toasters so that is another example of internet of things where you can remotely set the switch on or switch off time of a toaster and other parameters related to it okay how you can monitor the energy consumption of your house okay so you have a smart device a smart meter which is connected to the internet and you can remotely measure how much units of energy you have consumed in a particular day remotely via an application which can be running on a laptop connected to the internet or on your mobile phone okay and these days most of the phones in our offices as well we basically are internet enabled phones okay so all communication is happening via the internet rather than happening over traditional telephone lines okay cable tv that can be remotely managed okay and you even have internet refrigerators or fridges which can monitor the actual temperature inside the fridge how much space is available inside the fridge and some of these fridges they can even connect to websites such as amazon or tesco or sainsbury or over here you have uh, something like maybe hyperstore so you can actually create an inventory or list of the food items which are available in the fridge and which are running out say for example you are running out of milk okay the fridge is connected to the internet it can automatically detect that a certain food item as uh, is running out so it can automatically order it online for you okay so these are some of the examples of internet enabled devices or we call fun internet appliances okay everyday devices which are connected to the internet but which enable the user to actually view the configuration or monitor whatever that uh, whatever information is being provided by that device okay so first we were discussing what is a network okay so we discussed the nuts and bolts or the important uh, parameters of a network now we are taking a look at the global internet okay so what is the internet the global internet is a network of different networks which are interconnected to each other who is managing these independent networks these are interconnected via internet service providers companies such as ptcl orange british telecom AT&T, Sprint, Horizon, all of these are major internet service providers. They basically connect your individual networks to the global network. Okay, so the internet itself is a spread out, or let's say, a combination of different types of networks which are glued together. Okay, which are interconnected together. This also includes your modern mobile networks. Okay, your home networks, your campus networks. your city or metropolitan area networks all of which in turn connect to an internet service provider and the internet service providers are in turn connected with each other so that comprises or that basically results in the creation of a global internet okay. now there has to be a certain set of rules that we need to use in order to communicate over this network okay so any two end systems whether they are running windows whether they are running linux whether they are android based platforms they need to communicate with each other over this global internet or this global network of networks how is that communication accomplished what parameters do we need to agree upon or what is going to be the details of our communication all of that is going to be handled by something called protocols so protocols control the sending and receiving of messages important protocols or protocols that you are going to come across in everyday life are TCP which stands for transmission control protocol IP internet protocol you would have heard of HTTP which is hypertext transfer protocol most of us would have used Skype at some point okay Skype is a protocol on itself most of us also use Wi-Fi so Wi-Fi also adheres to or conforms to a certain set of protocols which are covered under IEEE 802.11 so the protocols basically enable the exchange of messages between two end systems over the network okay over any network 
there are certain standardizing bodies which basically define these protocols okay so there are two sets of internet standards the first one is called an rfc which stands for request for comments and the second one is iet ietf which is internet engineering task force okay so request for comments works like this you develop a new protocol you specify the specification okay the details the working principle of that protocol online on the ietf website under something called request for comments an rfc when you publish it people start finding bugs in your algorithm or in your code they advise you that this needs to be changed in certain way once you update that it becomes a standard it becomes a adopted okay each rfc has an rfc number associated with it so sometimes you can refer to a particular protocol such as tcp by the name tcp and infrequently or uh, let's say not very common but you can also refer to tcp by its rfc number okay so bear in mind that whoever is designing these protocols has to get these protocols published and approved by ietf which is the internet engineering task force and the way of doing it is by adding it on the ietf website the complete specification and requesting for comments from the general public and from engineers and technicians and what not so that you can work out what are the issues with that particular standard once you have fixed the issues or people are comfortable in using it they can start referring to that particular rfc number now let's take a look at what is the internet from a service view perspective okay or from a service provider's perspective let's say we have the infrastructure that provides services to different types of applications so the global internet is like a service okay that is providing a set of applications for the end users or consumers what types of applications website viewing or web page viewing voip which stands for voice over ip that is communicating over the internet by using applications such as skype or google meet or what not email related applications so we use gmail quite often okay online games e-commerce related applications such as amazon over here draz etc social networks twitter facebook so all of these services are basically being provided by different companies which are connected to the global internet so the internet serves as an infrastructure support framework or an infrastructure that enables the use of these applications by uh, different consumers in addition to that it also provides a programming interface to applications okay so you can write a web browser application yourself you can write an email based application yourself all you need to do is link up that application or hook that application to the internet so the other people can actually start using your application via the internet okay so these are some of the service options which are available to the end user by the presence of this global infrastructure that we call the internet so multiple applications such as web voip email games e-commerce social networking even online educational courses etc these are the types of applications that are available and then secondly from a programming perspective you can write applications which can use the global internet so that your application can be delivered or they can be used by consumers across the world Okay, so now let's take a look at what is a protocol okay human protocols are quite simple when you ask someone what is the time or i have a question or you introduce yourself the other person quickly understands what you mean so if you ask for the time somebody is going to say okay he doesn't have a watch or he wants me to tell him the time so you are going to give him the time somebody asks i have a question you ask him okay what is the question okay general introductions amongst each other what is the baseline of all of this that a specific message is being sent you record the message or you try to understand the message and then you take an action based on that message somebody asks you what's the time first thing that you do is understand what is being asked the second thing is taking an action on that request if you have a watch you look up the watch and you reply back with the time so that is a human protocol okay network protocols are quite similar okay 
but this time around instead of humans machines are talking to each other your end systems your computers laptops etc they are talking to each other okay so all communication that is happening over the internet is governed by some kind of a protocol the protocol is going to define the format of the message the order in which the message is going to be sent and received among different types of network devices and what types of actions to take on the message okay once it has been transmitted and once it has been received so this is a more formal view of whatsapp protocol okay we have a timeline diagram human protocol is on the left side where we say hello the other person says hello and we say what is the time have you got the time the other person says it's 2 o'clock similar scheme happens between two machines so on the right side you have a client and server architecture you have a client computer which is connecting to a server let's suppose that the protocol that is being used is transmission control protocol or tcp so the computer initiates a connection okay it asks for a connection request that i need to connect to you this particular server the server based on the configuration or the built in settings is going to create a tcp connection response okay so it is going to say okay that is fine i am allowing you to connect to this server or myself okay next request from the client is can you please provide me with this particular web page which is awl.com/qrosfas and as a response a file is sent back to the laptop the web browser which basically displays all the objects and all the text and everything that is included on that particular web page okay so again we need to define the format in which this connection request is going to get generated in what order this connection request is going to get received by the server what type of action the server is going to take on this particular request and then what is going to be the next step so all of these criteria or all of these parameters or the way you are going to make a connection with another entity on the internet is defined by a protocol okay in this particular example we have used tcp as a protocol okay so what i want you to do is in your free time or whenever you get time look at other human protocols and also look at other machine or network related protocols in addition to tcp at least try to remember what is ip what is internet protocol what is http hypertext transfer protocol what is ftp file transfer protocol so these are the prominent or different types of protocols that you are going to come across in the course so get used to the idea of what is the actual abbreviation okay what does it stand for and what does this protocol do even if you understand it in one of the simplest terms so moving on to the next section now 1.2 we are going to discuss the edge network the end systems the access networks and the links that comprise a global network or any network so over here we have a closer look at the network structure the network edge comprises of your hosts which can be clients and servers the difference between a client and a server is that the server is often placed in a data center and a server is responsible for providing information to the clients whether it is a web page whether it is a file whether it is something from the database that is going to be provided by a server residing quite often in a data center a dedicated facility for hosting the servers and then you have the hosts which are your clients usually the clients which are connecting to servers sometimes servers can also connect with other servers so they can change their role from a server to a client when they connect to another server okay so these are your primary types of hosts then you have the access networks or the physical media how is the client connecting to the server whether it is connecting via a wired medium whether it is a wireless communication link or whether it is a combination of wired and wireless communication link. so you are connecting wirelessly to your wifi access point but the wifi access point in turn is connected via wire to the router or to another network okay so it can be a combination the entire path between the client and the server it could be a combination of wired as well as wireless 
and then finally you have the core of the network the heart of the network which has plenty of interconnected routers okay so you have at least 2 3 maybe 10 15 15 routers which are connected to each other via some kind of physical or wireless media okay and each of these routers in turn is connected to another network so that basically results in creation of a network of networks so in the example on the right you can see your mobile network which is connected via a router to a router in the global isp okay the global isp is connected to the regional regional isp via two links connecting two routers on either side then you have the home network in which your wireless access point or your home router or broadband router is connecting to a router on the regional isp and finally a campus network at the bottom in which the router at the top is connecting to a router on the regional isp side okay so all together when you uh, join up these five different independent networks you have a network of networks okay and the larger it grows it starts feeling similar to the global internet so in this next step we check how access networks and physical media actually relate with each other and with the network as a whole so the question is how to connect an end system which can be your servers client computers laptops etc to an edge router okay for this purpose we have two or let's say three different types of networks we have a residential access network how does that connect to the edge router we have institutional access such as your campus network or university network and then you have mobile access networks that is your mobile phones directly connecting to 3g 4g or 5g etc we have to bear a few things in mind regarding these connections or regarding the links that are getting shared what is the bandwidth of the name that is how many bits per second can be transferred over a particular link whether that is wired or wireless and secondly whether the link is shared between multiple different systems or whether it is a dedicated link that is a one to one link between two different systems okay so the very first system that we describe is the access network that is used in the home networking environment okay in home networks traditionally whenever we want to connect to the internet we use a technology that is called dsl okay dsl stands for digital subscriber line in this particular figure you can see the architecture of a digital subscriber line in the home environment you have a telephone line that is coming in the home okay this telephone line is coming from an exchange or from a telephone networks central office the line ends at a splitter okay the splitter is responsible for basically dividing the signal between your telephone and your data okay so the splitter is going to split the traffic that is coming over the link part of that is going to go to your landline or phone and the remaining half is going to go towards something called a dsl modem modem stands for modulation and demodulation so this modem is responsible for taking the data from the splitter and providing it further on to your end systems such as your computer or your laptop on the other side of this network on the other side of the splitter the cable is attached to something called a dslam okay this dslam is a server let's say that is available in the network of your internet service provider so this dslam resides at your telephone exchange okay the dslam stands for D dsl access multiplexer okay so whatever traffic it is connected to whatever link it is connected to upstream that is your telephone network or the internet service provider or the global internet we can basically split the internet that is coming from different internet service providers using this dslam that is we can multiplex that same internet connection onto multiple different homes and within each home you are going to have a splitter and a dsl modem the splitter is going to split the telephone or voice communication from the actual data so the dslam is basically multiplexing the telephone network and the internet provided by the internet service provider over a single cable that is connecting your dslam to your house and this cable is a normal telephone cable that is carrying both the telephone signal as well as the digital data signal okay this is your typical home broadband environment 
that is using existing telephone lines to transfer data and to connect you to the internet. Okay. So main features in DSL are that we use existing telephone lines to the central offices DSLAN and data over DSL phone line goes to the internet whereas voice over DSL phone line goes to the telephone network. Typically digital subscriber line is asymmetric. Okay, we call it ADSL which basically means that the upload and the download speed is quite different from each other. So the upstream can be less than 2.5 meg or it can be 1 meg whereas the downstream or downloading can be up to 24 meg or typically it can be something around 10 meg. You can use different types of online testing services to test the internet connection and test the bandwidth on your respective networks. Okay. So this is your typical DSL technology okay, or home broadband service. A secondary type of technology is also available which we call <coughs> fiber to the home. Okay. In which case instead of using a DSL connection you are using a fiber optic cable to the home to deliver both data as well as voice which is your telephone. And in addition to that you can also provide cable services that is cable TV services over a fiber optic network. Okay. The present slide shows you a typical architecture of uh, fiber optic cable. Okay. So in this particular scenario instead of the DSLAM we have another device at the local exchange or at the internet service providers premises which is called a cable head end. Okay. This cable head end is connected to each of the homes within your network. That is the internet service provider is selling this service to all the subscribers or all the different households. Okay. And it is connected via something called a fiber optic cable. In this fiber optic cable typically there are six different video channels. Okay. In addition to that there are two data channels and then finally you have a control channel as well which is for managing your cable modem. The architecture is quite similar to a DSL modem apart from the fact that instead of a DSLAM you have a cable head end at the local exchange and in the premises in addition to the splitter now instead of having a DSL modem you have a cable modem. Okay. So the cable modem is going to provide you with the data okay. so two at least two channels of data one channel for controlling the cable modem or the configuration of the cable modem. And then finally you have at least six channels which are carrying video. So you can connect the cable modem to your television as well or you can connect let's say the splitter to the television channel. Okay. And in addition to that it is quite normal to have a telephone connection which is also going to use at least one of the data channels okay, which is voice over internet protocol or voice over IP. So now your single cable which is a fiber optic cable is not only carrying data as well as voice communication but also TV channels. Okay. How do we manage this? How can one single fiber optic cable basically cater to the needs of all three different types of services? It does so by using something called frequency division multiplexing. That is the different channels in this example nine different channels out of which six are video, two are data, one is control are all transmitted over a different frequency band. Okay. Different frequency band basically means that the wavelength of light that you are using in the fiber optic for each of these channels is different. Okay. So it is a different color of light. Because it has a different wavelength so it has a different frequency as well. So you can introduce or include multiple different signals or light signals let's say over the same fiber optic cable where each signal is being transmitted at a different wavelength or at a different color. So that makes it possible for a fiber optic cable to carry multiple different data channels. The cable head end is part of something called CMTS. Okay, So instead of having a typical telephone exchange now you have something called a cable modem termination system. This is just an enclosure just a building that is going to include multiple different cable head ends. Okay. The link that is carrying the fiber optic link that is terminating on one side at the cable head end and on the other side at a splitter at each of the residential premises 
has data and TV transmitted at different frequencies like I explained in addition to voice as well which is your telephone signal. The typical setup for a fiber optic cable is called HFC or hybrid fiber coaxial cable. Okay. It can offer you up to 30 megabits downstream that is download and at least 2 meg upload. Okay. However, with the modern services that are on offer, especially with the PTCL, uh, we can even get up to 100 meg download and at least around 25 to 30 meg upload. Okay. So that is also quite a possibility. However, if we go with the textbook standard or uh, let's say where we actually started from, then in asymmetric hybrid fiber coaxial cable, you can have up to 30 meg download and up to 2 meg upstream traffic. The network of the cable attaches to the splitter like I explained. The splitter in turn attaches to your cable modem. Sometimes the cable modem also has built-in Wi-Fi. Sometimes it has multiple built-in ports so that you can connect your computers, laptops wirelessly to this cable modem as well as plug it in using Ethernet cables. Okay. And unlike the DSL, okay, which has access to, which has dedicated access to the central office, you can see in this particular figure that the fiber optic cable, the same fiber optic cable that forms the backbone between the CMTS and the splitter is being shared or tapped into by multiple different homes. Okay, So there is no single one-to-one -one connection between CMTS and each of these houses. Instead, the CMTS is connected to a backbone fiber optic cable and the fiber optic cable in turn is being shared between multiple different households by tapping into that fiber optic cable. And the present uh, uh, slide shows you uh, the inner workings of this particular modem. So the key cable or DSL modem is in turn connected to a router, a firewall or a NAT device. We'll cover NAT when we cover chapter four. NAT stands for network address translation. This is used for port forwarding and it is also used to translate IP addresses, okay. especially if you are hosting a server within your own home. So the router in turn is connected to something called uh, Wi-Fi access point. Typically what happens is that even if the cable or DSL modem is separate, the router and the Wi-Fi access point are built into a single device. Okay. That is what the dot dotted line is showing. And it is also quite often or uh, quite, uh, let's say, feasible for the user if the cable modem, the router, and the Wi-Fi access point are all three embedded into a single device, which we normally refer to as a home broadband router. So that is going to conserve space. Instead of having three different devices, you are going to have one single device, and the functionality for all these three devices is going to be built into a single device. So that is typically what we have, a single Wi-Fi or broadband router at home at the back of which you have multiple ports so you can connect your devices via ethernet cable to that and in addition to that it also has built-in antennas as well to provide wi-fi service so you have a single consolidated or monolithic device which is responsible for providing all three functionalities that of modulation and demodulation that is modem routing which is your router and the wi-fi access point all combined into a single box Next, we have an enterprise access network or an ethernet network. This setup is quite similar to the setup that you have seen in the university. You have multiple different computers, laptops, which can be connected via ethernet cable to your nearest switch, which is called an ethernet switch, or it can be wirelessly connected to a wireless access point. The wireless access point in turn is also connected via a link to your switch. The switch in turn is connected to something called a router. The router is your institutional's link uh, your campus's link to the global internet. So the router acts as a gateway to provide the internet service to all of these devices via the switch. In addition to that, because in an institution or a campus, you can have multiple different types of services on offer, such as you have Slate, Flex, etc. So for that, you have dedicated web servers built in into the data center of that, uh, that particular campus. And these servers also connect via links to your switches 
the switches in turn again connect to the central router or gateway that is connected to the internet. This kind of a system is typically used in companies, universities, academic institutes, organizations as well. The transmission rates that are available can range anything between 10 megabits per second to 10 gigabits per second. Okay. Today, many of the end systems that we have available, such as your laptops, personal computers, mobile phones, typically connect to an Ethernet switch either via a wired network or wirelessly using something like Wi Fi technology. The wireless access networks in turn, they can be of two types. The very first type or the very basic type that you have come across earlier is wireless local area network or a wireless LAN. The range of a wireless access point is usually 100 feet and the technology standard that is used is IEEE 802.11b or g depending on which particular scheme you are going for. The data rate can be different ranging from 11 to 54 megabits per second. Whereas on the other side, you have uh, another type of a wireless network, which is called a wide area wireless network. Okay. This is usually provided by your telecom or cellular mobile companies. The range of this network is usually 10 kilometers from every BTS tower, from every base transceiver station. And the amount of data that you can transfer can vary between one and 10 megabits per second, depending on whether you are using 3G, 4G, long-term evolution LTE or maybe 5G technology. In this particular slide, we'll take a look at the transmission rate. Okay, what do we mean by transmission rate or what is the transmission rate of data between transferred between two different end systems? Okay. So on the host side, you have an application message that needs to be sent. The computer on the left side breaks this message into much smaller pieces. And let's say that we call these smaller chunks or pieces as packets. Okay. So one large message is divided into smaller pieces and each of these messages is called a, or each of these pieces is called a packet. Let's suppose that the length of each of those packets is L bits. Okay. Then the transmission rate, the amount of bits that you can transfer or the amount of packets that you can transfer over the link given on the right side between your and system and the switch is going to determine the bandwidth or the transmission rate. Okay, so let's suppose that the link is capable of transmitting data at a rate of R. Okay, so the transmission rate is R. Then how much time is it going to take to transfer X number of bits over this link? Okay. R is obviously going to be in bits per second as well. That is your transmission rate. So you take the total amount of bits that you need to transfer and divide it by the transmission rate. That will give you the amount of delay it requires to basically transfer that many bits across the network. Okay. So host is going to break down a large message into smaller pieces called packets. Let's suppose that each packet is of length L bits. The transmission rate or the link rate between the host and the switch is R bits per second. So L divided by R is going to give you the amount of time it will take for L bits to be transferred to the switch over a link with a transmission rate of R. So the basic equation okay, or the link capacity or let's say the link bandwidth is determined by having your packet transmission delay equal to the time needed to transmit L bits into the link which has a transmission rate of R. So in mathematics or in mathematical format, it will be simply L divided by R. That is the time that is required to transmit L bits over a transmission link, which has a capacity of transmitting R bits per second. We have certain terminologies that are quite important when it comes to physical media. Very first one is bit. This is the amount of data that propagates between the transmitter and receiver pairs. Okay, usually a single binary number. Then you have the physical link that is what is connecting your transmitter to a receiver. Okay. Link itself can be of wired or wireless type. Okay. Then there are two different types of media that basically form this link. Signals either propagate in solid media, that is copper, fiber, coaxial cable, etc., or unguided media, which is wireless. Okay. 
signals propagate freely as in the case of radio waves when it comes to guided media then again there is a particular category of cable called twisted pair or tp cable okay there are two types of insulated copper wires that are generally available category 5 which is able to support 100 megabits per second to 1 gigabit per second okay that is the transmission rate r that we discussed in the previous slide or you have category 6 which is capable of transmitting as much as 10 gigabits per second the physical media the coaxial cable or the fiber what are the properties of a coaxial cable there are two concentric copper conductors okay there is bidirectional communication that is sender and receiver can send and receive data simultaneously it is often used in broadband technology where you have multiple channels on a cable and a typical example of a coaxial cable can be hfc okay. so you have uh, you would have seen a normal tv cable okay this is your coaxial cable in which there is an outer sheath okay or a mesh and inside it is a plastic insulator and inside the plastic insulator you have a straight copper cable okay so these are your two wires of this particular cable the fiber optic cable on the other hand is glass fiber okay that can carry light pulses and each pulse is considered to be a bit it offers a very high speed operation at the speed of light okay and it is of the order of tens to 100s of uh, tens to hundreds of gigabit per second transmission rate that is r it has very very low error because of low interference if you need a repeater to regenerate the signal again they can be spaced far apart as many as much as 10 kilometers and it is also immune to electromagnetic radiation or electromagnetic noise which often affects your everyday coaxial cable the second type of physical media is radio wave communication or wireless communication in this form of uh, communication or link the signal is carried over the electromagnetic spectrum there is no physical wire communication can be bidirectional that is the sender and receiver can send and receive data simultaneously at the same time the propagation environment however is affected by things such as reflection obstruction by objects such as big buildings they can stop mobile signals and general interference from other household devices like microwaves etc okay. so they uh, are prone to noise and they affect the quality of the signal okay. the radio link types can be of several types the most common one is terrestrial microwave this can offer you up to 45 megabits per channel okay. then you have local area network wifi 11 meg or up to 54 megabits per second wide area that is cellular 3g cellular can offer quite a bit of megabit per second okay. with 4g obviously we have increased the amount of data capacity with 5g this is going to go on even further okay satellite communication finally satellite communication is quite expensive satellite signals or uh, uh, let's say the architecture of a satellite network is quite complex and it is quite costly to operate that is why the amount of data that is carried by the satellite also comes at a very high price whereas at a very low data rate okay so it can range from a few kilobits per second to up to 45 megabits per megabits per second per channel okay or this 45 meg is divided into multiple smaller channels because of the physical distance between our transmitting and receiver station on ground and the satellite there is a bit of propagation delay as well before the signal actually gets to the satellite and before the satellite actually transmits it back to another ground base another ground station so you can have maybe 270 milliseconds of end to end delay for leo or even geo stationary satellites there are two types of general satellites leo satellites which are low earth orbit which are closer to the earth and then there are geo stationary which are at a fixed distance from the earth and which basically conform to the rotation of the earth so the satellite appears stationary if you look at it from the ground whereas a low earth orbit satellite moves at quite a fast rate or at a speed so when you are observing it from the ground you can actually see it moving in the space so that brings us to the end of chapter number 1 if you have any questions please write them down so that we can discuss them during the live session tomorrow